I mean, it's easy to show a man how to be saved from Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> but let's read the first verse. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We have not changed context in what we're actually dealing with all through chapter 9, and it's not going to change in chapter 10. Now, we're going to get some information that absolutely applies to us as Gentiles. In fact, he's kind of just telling them, look, this is the way it is now. But he's addressing, he wants Israel to be saved. He loves his people. He loves his, his kinfolk. But he also is going to tell them the truth that, look, here's the situation you're in for a long time. He doesn't know how long. And if you want to be saved, this is how you get saved. You're going to get saved the same way these Gentiles get saved. And there ain't no difference. And there's not. No, no Jew on this planet has any more advantage to being saved than anybody else. Not, not in this age. Now, in the tribulation, that might be a different matter. But not now. Um, we, we've, I told you we're dealing with three chapters that deal with Israel. Chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. And chapter 11 gets really involved. In fact, it's one of the most important chapters in the entire New Testament because if you get that one wrong, you'll get your whole Bible wrong. So they're important. But chapter 10 reveals the method of salvation in this age aimed at the Gentiles. But he's telling these individual Jews they can get in on it. All right? Now, how do we know we're still talking about Israel? Look in, chap in chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. Look in verse 5. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law. That was given to the Jews. Moses gave the law to the Jews. Look at verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? For first Moses saith. Look at verse, um, verse 21. It says, but to Israel he saith. That's the last verse in the chapter. The first verse and the last verse has Israel in it. So he's addressing them. Now this chapter is one we're going to, you'll be going to, anytime you bring somebody to Christ, you're going to be going to this chapter. But I just want you to get the context that he is telling Israel, look, this is how it is. You've been set aside. In fact, he's going to tell them that in chapter 11. Um, chapter 9 was rough enough on them. Uh, that God was turning away from them, but his, his prayer is still that they'll be saved. And how can they be saved? The same way the Gentiles get saved in this age, by grace through faith. So he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he did win some. And there are still Jews being saved. We call them Messianic Jews. They believe that Jesus was the Messiah and Savior. Okay? In verse 2, he says, For I bear them record that they have... Well, let me see. I, well, let me back up just a second. Chapter 10. 10 is the number of the Gentiles. So Romans 10 is the greatest chapter on how God saves the Gentiles in this age. In 10 verse 9, he uses the word thou in reference to the Romans, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Uh, talking to the Romans. In 10.10, he says... Um, well, let me read it. For with the heart, man, what man? Any man. In verse 11, he says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever. How many of you are a whosoever? Raise your hand. And if you're not, what are you? <laughs> what pronoun can we call you? Uh, verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Notice he puts no difference between them. And then in verse 13, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Again, a whosoever. So I don't want to bend this thing so much to Israel that we, don't, that we miss the whole, <laughs> the meat of the thing. And it's talking about salvation in this age. And it's whosoever will. Let him come. Um, verse, well, um, Romans 10 makes it clear. 10 being the number of the Gentiles. I've already said this. Okay, I'm just reading my notes. Verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This one, this one kind of sticks in my claw a little bit, um, because there's, 
and, and, and Baptists can be so guilty of this that they, they want so much zeal they don't care if they have any knowledge. And I like Christians with zeal too. But let me tell you something. The Jews had zeal when they're hammering the nails into their Messiah's hands and feet as they're hoisting him up on a cross. He said in Psalm 69, 9 about Israel, it says, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. They, they had zeal, all right. They killed their Messiah. What didn't they have? Knowledge of who they were putting on that cross. Paul was exceedingly zealous. He said in Acts 22, verse 3 and 4, he says, I verily am a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. What did he lack? He lacked, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Like just a little bitty thing, you know, of who he was. So someone with zeal, by the way, uh, ISIS has zeal, okay? Uh, Hezbollah has zeal. Hamas has zeal. And they're killing people. Zeal without knowledge is a dangerous thing. Knowledge tempers zeal and points it in the right direction. Um, he says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This debunks, you know, uh, fundamentalist doctrine about a teaspoon of knowledge is a dangerous thing, or a teaspoon of no you can drown in a teaspoon of knowledge, or a teaspoon of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Actually, that latter part is true, that a teaspoon of, just, just a teaspoon of knowledge is a dangerous thing. That's the problem. Christians don't know anything. In Proverbs 14, 18, he says, The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. You know, they take one verse in the Bible that's negative about knowledge, but it's not negative about knowledge, it's negative about the person that possesses it. It says that knowledge puffeth up. It does. You know, you notice when you get too much knowledge, you know, you think you're a know-it-all? Every... Every teenager that ever learned anything thought he was a know-it-all, and over time he realized that he doesn't. And preachers realize that they don't, okay? Uh, but there, you're always going to have that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get knowledge. It means that you shouldn't be puffed up about it. That's all that means. Uh, Jeremiah 3.15 says this, he says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's my job. In fact, you can't be a pastor unless you're apt to teach. And yet we've got them all over the country, and they can't teach anything. They can't rightly divide. They don't want to study. I mean, study is a weariness of the flesh. When I got up this morning and I started tackling this thing, I started at like 7.15. I looked up at 11, about 11 o'clock, and I went, oh. I said, I go, go take care of the animals. Wouldn't take care of us, come back, and it took me another hour, hour and a half. And that's a long time for me to sit there and just try to, and this is simple stuff. This is not that complex. But it takes study. I have, to, I, have to, I have to run all the references. I have to see what is it talking about. Am I getting this right? Not just what I think is right. Is it right? Does other scripture agree with this? Why? Because it's my job to teach you. It's my job to impart knowledge to you. Um, because it says he'll feed you with knowledge and understanding. Bible ignorance is the basis of every cult. Bible ignorance mixed with zeal <laughs> is a deadly concoction leading to damnation. You know what we call it? We call it religion. That's what we call it. I mean, it's religious people killing other people. No Bible-believing Christian's out to kill anybody. He's out to win them to Christ. It's only some, this religious bunch with a, a ton of zeal that are out to kill a bunch of people because they don't agree with them. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, look at verse 3 and 4. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, there's, our, there's the righteousness he's talking about. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. All right? So in a sense, religion is as a man pitting his righteousness against God's righteousness. And what that man is saying, he is as good as or even better than God's righteousness. Now, I know you wouldn't think that. But when somebody holds on to their righteousness, you know, I mean, they just hold on to it like, no, no I, I know I'm a good person. You know, well, they, you must think you're better than God because God says you're not. God says that there's none that doeth good, no, not one. I mean, yeah, your standard that you've lived up to, which is according to probably some man's standard, it's not God's standard. Nobody's living up to God's standard. The finest Christian you know isn't living. He might be living closer to it, but he's not living up to it. Not completely. Um, this is kind of, this thing about religion, um, man pitting his righteousness against God's righteousness, illustrated in Cain. Cain was trusting his own works. Abel was trusting that animal dying on that altar. Cain was trusting his good works to, to gain favor with God. That's religion. Most of the world has religion. I know we like to think, oh, most of the world's Christian. No, they're not. They can have, they can believe everything, just about everything in the Bible gets salvation wrong, and they're lost. And a lost man's a lost man. You understand that? He might be a decent lost man, but he's still lost. A lot of times we don't, you know, a lot of times we won't witness to that kind of man. You know, the decent ones. Because we just think, no, I mean, he seems he's such a nice guy. I think, I think maybe he's saved. Why? He's such a nice guy. And we don't witness to that guy. We just let him go along, you know, and he just perishes. He's just trusting in his own good works. My mom was like that. Decent, honest human being. They had compassion for people. I mean, wouldn't turn a blind eye to a need. She was like that. And they're the toughest ones to win. Also, it's illustrated in Luke 18. Remember you got the, um, the sinner and the publican? Uh, I'm sorry, you got the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee's praying thus with himself, I thank thee, God, I am not as other men are. Oh, he thinks so highly of himself. There he is this sinner standing and praying, you know, and, and not like this publican, and there's this poor old publican over there. He's the tax collector, by the way. Everybody hates him. And he's probably stealing, you know, and charging more and fees and finding a way to rip off people, you know. And he just, you know, he just feels so guilty. He's just doing this, you know. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Bible says he, would, he went down to his house justified rather than that Pharisee. One was pitting his religion against God's righteousness, and the other one was saying, I'm just a sinner. And asked for mercy, and God gave him mercy. Um, so the difference between your own righteousness and God's righteousness is who you put your faith in. A religious person is putting their faith in themselves. In fact, I really truly believe this, because when you talk to somebody, you know, and you're talking to them about the Lord, and they're kind of you almost think that they've created God in their image because it sounds so much like them. <laughs> You're kind of looking at them, you know. Your name doesn't start with a G, does it? Because they're, the, the way they're describing them is like, you know, they're describing themselves. Self-deification, I guess. Uh, Romans 1.17. I'll let you turn there because I, I haven't let you turn anything yet. Romans 1, 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now what he's talking about is Old Testament faith versus New Testament faith. From faith to faith. And it changed. It is different. You say, why? By one word. If you go back and read that, what, uh, the just shall live by faith, here's how it is. In Habakkuk, 
You don't need to find, try to find it. Habakkuk try, at chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Paul said the just shall live by faith. The difference is that in the New Testament, you are living by faith, but it's somebody else's. In the Old Testament, you're living by your own faith, and you've got to prove that faith by works. Faith to faith. He's telling that Jew, big difference, man. You're no longer living by believing those Old Testament laws and following through those things on a daily basis. You're going to trust Jesus Christ, and he's going to save you instantaneously and, and for eternity. That's big. That's huge. What God accomplished at Calvary is so fantastic and amazing, it, it just leaves me awestruck. Because he covered all the bases. He covered everything, man. It is perfect. You cannot mess this up. Whereas in the Old Testament, man, you could mess up and go to hell. So, faith to faith, it went from you follow your own faith, and you, and you prove that faith through works. That's why the Bible says in James, written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, that faith without works is dead. Now, we've got works on our side, but it's not our works, is it? It's the works of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Even the faith is the faith of Christ. So the faith in Jesus Christ's righteousness is a completed work it's a completed work requiring nothing from you but faith in it. The righteousness of the law is not a completed work, but requires your constant attention to it to be saved. That's what they had to do. They, they were constantly having to do something. Whether it be a, a, a new moon feast, or whether it be a sacrifice, or a Sabbath, they had to keep doing it. I mean, I got saved... 45, 46 years ago. I don't have to redo it. I don't have to say the same words every day even. It's done. That wasn't true un under the law. And he's explaining that from faith to faith. Uh, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That little phrase there says for... Um, for Christ is the end of the law. That's true. Now, first things first, Matthew 5, 17. And Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay? Once he fulfilled the law, we know that he takes it out of the way of the Christian. Is, is the law still present? Okay, can you get righteousness by the law now? That's what got done away. The law didn't disappear because guess what? Every lost man that's rejected Christ so far is under that law. But it can't justify him. If that Jew followed the law and he followed, he followed the sacrifices and the new moons and the Sabbaths and whatever he was supposed to do, God would credit that man with salvation. And when I mean credit, I mean credit. Pull out the plastic, man. And because why? Because Jesus Christ would have to come four years later and pay for it. But once Christ showed up and paid for it, that system's done away. It's antiquated. Okay? Um, what God offers now to a man, to an unsaved man who is a sinner is the righteousness of a perfect man. You know, I, we think when he came down here and he lived this perfect, sinless life, it was to condemn us. It wasn't to condemn us. It was to save us. You say, why? Well, it's one thing for God to die for all your sins or for the Lord to die for all your sins on that cross and pay for all of them, but what are you going to do about you still have to have a life that is in righteousness? You can't just show up to God and he says, there's nothing here. You have a history, it's blank. What, what happened? He has to see a perfect, sinless life. Right? 
You can't just say, you know, uh, uh, you know it's all under the blood. He's up. Where's your life? Christ lived it for you. Not only did he wash away your sins and pay for your sins, but he, he credited you with his life. A sinless life. That's why you're being offered the righteousness of a perfect man. Now, um, religion will blind a man. Will blind a man to his sin, and especially the necessity for a substitutionary atonement. Because once you get a handle on the fact that your sins are going to send you to hell, you're looking for a way out. You'll take any way. Who wants to go to hell? I mean, if you've ever thought about it, I mean, really thought about it, in agony, and there's nobody holding your hand, and there's no, your buddies aren't next to you, you don't know what's next to you. You're just in, you're just in pain. You're just in torment. And you think, I don't want to go to hell. That's me at 16. And God said, well, this is the way out. And I said, I'll take it. And I did. Religion will, will blind a man to that thing because he still thinks, I'm good enough. Don't tell me I'm not good enough. I'm a good person! <laughs> I'll kill you if you don't believe that. So religion, by definition, is good works. In fact, it, uh, here's a definition of religion. A set of beliefs, values, and practices based on the teachings of a spiritual leader heretic <laughs> all right you know you know it's you it's hard to get across to people that uh you win especially if they don't have any good teaching behind them, is convincing them that i tell these guys at the jail i said look i don't know what you're going to do for him if you get saved i don't know if you'll live for him but at least get saved now i know some people would probably criticize me for that but look he did pay for it and whosoever should call upon the name of the lord shall be saved it didn't say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and serve the Lord without distraction. You do not find that in there. Listen, most Christians do not serve God and have no plans to. And they're just as saved as I am. Now, they ain't going to have an inheritance like I hope I have, or I hope like some of you have. But the deal is good. The, the, the offer is legitimate. We just tend to want to add something to it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and help me live a sinless life from this point forward. <laughs> Don't ever pray anything like that. You haven't lived a sinless life from this point forward, have you? Why are you praying that for your converts? And help me in helping God to be faithful. I, I pray that prayer. I get, I get them saved, and then we can talk about everything else. Just accept the free gift of eternal life, and then we'll talk about everything else. Right? Religion blinds a man to that, and it blinded these Jews. He says Christ is the end of the law. Uh, John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Came with a different plan. Um... Like I said, I'm repeating myself here, but the law didn't disappear. But rather, righteousness is no longer attained by keeping the law of Moses. They could get that, that situation. And, and here's the funny thing about it. Because I, I don't want to... You're saying they got the, basically the same deal if they just kept the law in the Old Testament? No. They never even got a fraction of what you got. If they follow the law... Exactly, And then when they messed up, they made sacrifices. That tells you right there they couldn't keep it because they always had to make sacrifices for their sins. The sacrifices couldn't take away sin, but like I said, it was like credit cards. God was crediting because they believed him. Just do it. Okay, I'll take care of it later. But not one of them is born again. Not one. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. Now, after, after Jesus Christ dies on that cross and is resurrected, then we start seeing people with the new birth. And now there are millions of those that are born of God. Ours is a spiritual birth. His was a physical birth. He was born of God. But none of them are born of God. None of them receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. None of them receive the circumcision made without hands. None of them receded in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
None of them are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise where they can't lose it. And anytime you find an exception, it's the exception to the rule back there. Listen, when Jesus died on that cross and offering that salvation, it is unbelievable compared to what they were stuck under. Bound to something that could kill them. Bound to something that could damn them. I'm not bound to anything that can damn me. I'm bound to a Savior that loves me. That makes a big difference. Uh, so righteousness is no longer credited to a man based on keeping the law. And that, that's, that's, that's it. It's done. Even in the tribulation, they must have uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, they're not granted righteousness based upon solely upon the law. Romans 2, 7, and we looked at this verse. It says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. Whether it was the Jew or the Gentile, whether they were under the law or under conscience, the fact that they were doing the right thing. And I told you the big difference between that now is we're preaching to men that aren't doing the right thing. They're living wicked lives. And we're preaching the gospel to them, and they're getting saved. That couldn't happen in the Old Testament. Now, if they turn completely from their ways, and, and it, it took a turning, you've got to be careful about using the word turning from sin. That is not New Testament. Um, they're turning to God. Now, you say, well, that's turning from sin. You've got to be careful because you're, 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 you're getting close to saying you've got to turn from all your sins. Did you? Did you even know what they were? Are you still finding out what they are? Then you didn't turn from all of them, now did you? Got to be careful about that. The, the, I tell you what, the, uh, the repentance is not a turning. That's the fruit of repentance. Repentance is the change of mind that you understand that you're guilty and that you can't save yourself. You're guilty of sin and you can't save yourself and you're going to trust somebody else to save you. That's Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so righteousness in this age is imputed to a man who trusts Jesus Christ. In Romans 4.11, he says, um, talking about Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. I mean, he got the righteousness that was accredited to him before he was circumcised, while he was in uncircumcision. That's a picture, kind of us, that he got it by faith, alone, not by the works of the law. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And it has been. All we did was believe on him. And we got righteousness imputed unto us. It got put into our account. Um, okay, let's read verse 5 to 7. I'm going to move along here. It says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is, of the, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? And don't think when I saw this that I thought, oh man, this is going to be a rough passage. Because <laughs> I had no idea. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'll, I'll give it my best shot here. But look at verse 5 first. The righteous of the law is a code of conduct of which sacrifices have to be made when you come up short. All right? Uh, he said, the man that doeth those things shall live by them. It wasn't a one and done. It wasn't a um, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and then the next day you had to do it all over. I mean, that's, that's how we got saved. We got saved one time in an instant, never to be repeated. This is a lifelong thing. Now, you could be wicked, repent, turn from your evil ways, and then walk that line but you had to walk that line to the end. If you walked that line and then fell out and quit walking that line, you didn't make it. 
You can find that in the book of Ezekiel. I, mean, I can't remember the chapter right now. But Ezekiel talks about a, a man that um, a man that gets saved, that uh, repents and changes from his wicked ways, and, and he, that God has mercy on him. And then he talks about a man that was doing right, and then quit doing right, started doing wicked. Your example is Saul, who had the Spirit of God, the King of Israel, who had the Spirit of God, and then he lost it. You can't. You cannot lose the Spirit of God. He's sealed within you. But Paul lost it, and, he, and it says that, they, that an evil spirit came in its place. Okay? Now, there is one basic commonality between being saved in the Old Testament and saved in the New, and that is to believe what God said and act upon it. Now, in the Old Testament, if you believe what God said, you had to follow the law every day of your life and make the sacrifices. In the New Testament, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in an instant, you're saved. And you never have to repeat that thing. So by the law, the contrast between the two is by the law, you have to live it. Uh, Romans 7, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law of her husband so long as he liveth. But if, she be, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. And he's talking about the law being bound to that thing as long as it lives. And that's how they, they were bound to it. All right? We're bound to Jesus Christ. We're not bound to the law. In fact, somehow the Lord made it to where we died at salvation. And married, you know, because if, if you die, you're no longer bound to that mate, which was the law. Now you're free to marry another. And that other was Jesus Christ. And that's who I'm bound to now. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 13 says, But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. You see, they were doing it, and then they stopped doing it. And he said, I'm going to finish you for it, because you stopped doing it. I'm telling you, living under the Old Testament wasn't, I mean, it was a way. <laughs> I don't know if we'd make it. Uh, Galatians 3.12 says, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. You know it says that like six times in the Old Testament? The man that doeth them shall live in them, live in them, live in them. When you get in the law, man, you are people that uh, believe in keeping the Sabbath and all that stuff, you're welcome to it. But don't just keep one, keep it all. Because that's what it says. And the Bible says, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Has the law disappeared? No. But none of, the, none of the laws that I exist under right now that God has still given me, and by the way, some of them are the Ten Commandments, none of those can send me to hell. They have no dominion over me. Not that I shouldn't live by them. That's just, that's just good common sense. Okay? Uh, he says, um, Under the Old Testament, you're not only bound by the law, but you're dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He never quickened anybody in the Old Testament. That means he didn't make them alive. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't give them, uh, he didn't regenerate their spirit in the Old Testament. So what were they? They were dead in trespasses and sins. Bound to the law, dead in trespasses and sins, and when they died, which way did they go? They went down. Which way do you go when you die? Big difference, isn't it? I mean, if that law was so perfect and, it, and they were born again, why didn't they go up? when they died. They couldn't. Why? The atonement, their sins hadn't been paid for. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. They just kept, they just kept charging it. The Lord said, just keep charging it. I'll pay for it later. And he did. 
He even talks about purchasing or paying for the sins uh, uh, that were passed. All right? So let's look about the faith now. Um, first of all, he lived it for you. You're born again and made alive, John chapter 3. That's the first thing. He gives you life. You are regenerated. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and he regenerated. I was alive without the law once, sin revived, and I died. All right? You bear the righteousness of another. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's where I've got my righteousness. That's where you've got yours. What? In him. Why? He lived that sinless life for me. And it's been accredited to my account. And what happens upon death? You go up immediately to the presence of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Nobody in the Old Testament could do that. There, and the exception proves the rule. Talk about Enoch or we talk about Elijah, but they're the exception to the rule. They went down, not up. All right, verse 6 and 7 there. This is where it gets kind of tough. Um, so what is he talking about there? He says, you know, uh, uh, say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring down, uh, bring, uh, to bring down, or to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. And I, I would keep reading it over and over, thinking if I read it enough, maybe I'd understand it. Um, I think, I think he's referring to the work of salvation. Because when you think about going down to the depths to bring up Christ from above, death, burial, and then, or to bring him down, I mean, being at the right hand of God, ascending up to the right hand of God, makes me think of the death, burial, and resurrection. And what he's saying is the work of salvation was never possible by man. We do not have the ability to do what Jesus Christ did. Salvation was in his hands to complete and his righteousness to give us. Um, there's something else to this passage. Um, well, let me give you some verses first. And I've got to, ooh, I've got to hurry. It might be a little late tonight. Uh, Say not in thine heart. Um, and the passages we just read. The Lord is coming back again in his own timing, right? It's not in the will of man. Um, going up into space is not going to bring Christ down. Nor can they get up there to, to pull him off the throne and bring him down. They can't go up and visit him. Okay? It's not possible. So you certainly can't get up there to bring him down. And this is quoted from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4 and 5. And it says this. It says, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? And then it says in the very next verse, it gives you his name. It says, every word of God is pure. And in, Saul, or in Revelation 19, verse 13, it says, And his name is the Word of God. It says, um, Every word of God is pure. He's a shield of them that put their trust in him. The only one that can do these things, who can ascend and descend, in fact, we have the verses on it, but let me give you one more. In Psalm 24, 3, it says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? But we know who the who is now, right? Ephesians 4, verse 8 to 10. Look there. Ephesians 4, verse 8 to 10. You're told who does this. And it's Jesus Christ. And I think that's why the reason he's saying it, he's, 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 he's saying, don't say this, or, or you shouldn't be saying this. Why? Because you have nothing to do with your own salvation. You have nothing to do with this plan. This is God doing this, and you don't have the power to get up there or to go down there. We don't. 
is, listen, if you go down, you can't come back up. Not under your own power. In Ephesians 4, 8 to 10, it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, was it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So the answer to the who, and that one passage, all the different who did it, who, is Jesus Christ, the Word of God. But is there something else here? Well, the aim of the space program is not for exploration. That's not why they're up there. They are up there to bring something down or to bring someone down. Uh, I think they're up there looking for extraterrestrial life to prove at a minimum theistic evolution to try to prove the Bible's a lie. That's the minimum. Here's the kicker. Indeed, something will be coming down. Ezekiel 28, 14. And by the way, when it says there, um, how the verse read, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. And we're going to be talking about a Christ here. Ezekiel 28, 14 says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Talked about Lucifer. That word anointed is the word, same word as the New Testament, Christos or Mashiach, Messiah, anointed Christ. You didn't know there were two, did you? There's the Lord's Christ, and there's the devil's Christ, the Antichrist. There's two. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. And Luke 2.26 and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Even the Bible is very specific to tell you which one. There are two. Revelation 12, verse 8 to 9, talking about the devil. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. We know that's a third of the host. You think we have an invasion of illegal aliens right now. You haven't seen nothing yet. Are they coming down? You better believe they're coming down. And they're coming down to enslave anybody else that's down here. Because these beings are more powerful... And they know more than you do. But they're evil and they're wicked. And they're rebels against God. And God says, well, you didn't want me, so guess what you get? You didn't want my Christ, I'll give you one. And he does. And the Bible says he deceiveth the whole world. At least for a time, very short time, I might say it, by my dad. But he does defeat him. Now, but he doesn't just talk about bringing something down from above. He talks about something coming up from underneath. I got to think about that, and I said, well, you know, there is somebody coming up from underneath, just as if somebody's coming down from above. He said in Revelation 17, 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Something coming down from above, something coming up from beneath. And you know, we're always, we're always poking our nose somewhere. We want to poke it into space. We want to go down to, the, I mean, they've gone down to the very depths of the bottom of the ocean. I remember the first time I saw them smokers down there. I'm not talking about, I ain't talking about that. <laughs> I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about the vents they got down there that spew that, that we were talking about. Who was I talking to that about? Okay, Brother Mac. Talk about that, uh, that black smoke and that brimstone, that sulfur coming out of those vents. If you, I mean, how can you watch that and say, huh? Because doesn't that make you think of hell that the Bible talks about? The Bible talks about it enlarging itself and expect, to greet you at thy coming. I mean, when you see a volcano, you think, if hell's enlarging itself, it's got to make a little room for you. 
you know, spewing out this. I mean, lava. And, I mean, but here they are at the very bottom of the ocean. Here's these smokers. And I mean, they're just spewing out this hot ash, sulfur, black soot. When he talks about being cast into outer darkness, I mean, man, you can, you can visualize it at that point. When I saw that thing, I mean, it's the first thing I thought of. I don't know what, what, a, what a sinner was, when he was just looking at that thing, God and Son saved, you would think, you would think, well, that's hell. That's a vent right out of hell. I mean, we're going all the way down seven miles deep or five miles deep in finding these things. At the very, very bottom, man, they're finding these things. And then there's these worms that live off of the sulfur, and they're just kind of waving back and forth. They shoot up, and they come back. It, it, I think it might have been, I don't know if it was Jacques Cousteau when it found him, or I, I'd have got saved right there. I'd have hit my knees right there. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I mean, you know, you can find videos. Watch them. They go, just look up uh, uh, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. They call them smokers. Anyway, it, it, it's incredible to watch that. And you realize, you realize, man, there's n th exactly what your Bible says about hell. It's down there, under, it's right underneath your feet. Okay. That's the best I can do with it. Now, if you have a better understanding of, uh, of that passage, I'm, I'm open to it. Who shall ascend or who shall descend? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Anybody else? It's a quote from Deuteronomy 30. If I got that passage down, I probably didn't, did I? It's not Proverbs that I quoted from? Oh, is it? Okay, I missed that then. Let's read that. Okay, where's the Deuteronomy 30, verse 11? Okay, for this commandment which I command thee this day, is it not hidden from thee, neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh thee uh, in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. And that's later on in the chapter, isn't it? Yeah, is it the next verse? Um, that's interesting. I have to look at that. I don't know how I missed that. But I sure did. Let me write that down. Because when you're reading it, man, you're just like, what? It's almost like he just went off the rails and to another thought, but he's not. There's, there's, he's, making a, he's making a point, and I don't know if I've got that, that point that well. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's go on into our now. For some of you, this may be the first time that uh, you've taken the Lord's Supper, communion. No. So I did something with the pen. I don't know what I did with it. Anyway. 